Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the September edition of ICLR's Friday Forum. Today we will be talking about wildfire and uh, more specifically about what does the future hold for wildfire in Canada. Uh, our speaker today is Professor Mike Flanagan. Uh, he is a professor of wildland fire with the Department of Renewable Resources at the University of Alberta and also the director of the Canadian Partnership for Wildland Fire Science. Uh, Dr. Flanagan's primary research interests include fire and weather uh, interaction, including the potential impact of climate change, lightning ignited forest fires, and landscape fire modeling. He has been studying fire for over 35 years, and he has published over 200 papers on the topic. Uh, I would like to uh, let everyone know that if you have questions uh, through the webinar, please use the question and answer the question box that you have available uh, through Zoom, and uh, I will be happy to ask you questions at the end of the webinar to Dr. Flanagan. And with that, I'll pass it over to him. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are. Um, perhaps be more appropriate to talk about Hurricane Florence today, but I'm not a tropical meteorologist, so I will stick to the topic at hand. So I don't have a crystal ball. Um, I can't say for sure what the future is going to look like, but given the relationships that we are, we understand about fire, and weather and fuel ignitions, these are things that we expect will occur in the future. Um, this is a picture you see on this slide is uh, looking north, and that's Ashcroft, British Columbia this last summer, and that's the Elephant Hill fire, and that was a, a very active day. It was July 14th. About 4.45 in the afternoon, temperature was 36, 37, RH was 12%, winds were gusting in the 40s, and uh, some pretty extreme fire behavior. And the smoke you see in that slide, I was watching it on well, my satellite sites, and that smoke within the four or five hours we were there was already to Jasper National Park. So, uh, outline, I'm going to talk uh, generally about fire in Canada, briefly about climate change, impacts of climate change on wildfire, and then, okay, uh, if we expect, are expecting this to happen, what can we do about it? And there are things we can do about it. So in Canada, we have statistics that go back to about 1918, but in terms of reliable, probably starting around 1970, some people argue 1980 when you know satellites came into their, uh, their full age. Um, but we have about 7,000 fires, bring about 2.5 million hectares a year, half the size of Nova Scotia, to put in context. Um, many of these are uh, what we call crown fires, and the fire starts on the forest floor or on the Earth's surface, but gets carried up into the crowns of the trees, particularly conifers are very flammable, broadleaf trees in Canada much less so. Um, and sometimes, you know, if there's what we call ladder fuels that help carry the fire from the surface through the through shrubs or understory up into the crowns. So uh, light and fires, it varies from region to region and over time periods, but on average about 40% of the total fires but represent 80 to 90% of the area burned. And some of these fires are monitored and they occur in clusters um, and that's probably why they, they represent so much area burn. But I, I think one of the biggest take home messages, well there's two from, from this slide, is the fire size. 3% are larger than 200 hectares, hectares about the size of a football field, but they represent 97% of the area burned. Uh, Western United States, 1% of the fire are responsible for 99% of the area burned. So a relatively small number of fires that occur on a relatively small number of days of critical fire weather and conditions are responsible for most of the impact. So the tail wags the dog. It's really about extremes. Um, also, I say that you know the, the current area burned here is about average about 2.5 million hectares. 
In the 70s, the running average was closer to 1 million hectares. So we've doubled or slightly more than doubled since that period. And work done earlier uh, by colleagues and myself suggests strongly that this is due to human-caused climate change. So here's a, a map, and this is produced by Natural Resources Canada, showing evacuations from 1980 to 2017. And the size of the yellow dot indicates how many people were evacuated. So if you see, if you can see my mouse pointer, maybe you can't. You know, you see Fort McMurray's got a bigger circle and some of the circles in British Columbia are quite large. But, you know, one of the take home points here is that uh, evacuations occur from sea to sea to sea. And the gray areas in the background are kind of what we call the National Fire Database. So this was work done by Lynn Johnston and she works with the CFS looking at the wildland urban interface, the traditional wildland urban interface, but she also looked at the wildland industrial interface and the infrastructure interface. And you can see that the Southern Boreals and parts of BC and in Alberta, that there's a lot of development. And, you know, I don't have a trend map for this. This is static, but if one did have a trend, you could see that um, there's more activity spreading deeper into the forest, moving north, and we expect this to continue um, into the future. So this is a, a scan of my comic book I have on my shelf, the true story, as opposed to the untrue story of Smokey the Bear. Um, and it's really symbolic of you know, the historical philosophy used by many fire management agencies in Canada and the United States. Um, as an aside, fire management is the responsibility of the landowner. So in Canada, that means the provinces, the territories, national parks, and DND. So depending on how you count that, that's the 13, 14, 15 fire management agencies. And they're each do it their own way. Our fire management agencies are among the best in the world. We use, and all the agencies use, universally across Canada and many parts of the world, the Canadian Forest Fire Danger Rating System. And in fact, it is the de facto global standard for, especially for the fire weather. Um, the philosophy with Smokey the Bear, well, Smokey had two messages. You can prevent forest fires, and that's appropriate. The other was more nuanced that fire is bad. And fire is not bad, fire is natural, okay? In most situations. And the philosophy was, if you want to put a fire out, you hit it hard, you hit it fast. If the fire is the size of something less than a football field um, and you get a crew to it, you're, you're likely able to contain it. So, but things are changing um, the last decade or so and more looking at monitoring and manage. Uh, some jurisdictions like Ontario call appropriate response. Um, and even in BC this year, a number of the larger fires were what we call modified response, um, where you take some action on it and if, it's, if you don't, if the initial attack fails and you don't put the fire out, then you monitor the fire or work on the perimeter and um, you can allow some of these fires to grow big with a modified response. So what does it look like in terms of area burned by decade? And uh, you can see that the blue is the 80s, the purple is the 90s, at least on my monitor. And then that kind of yellowy color is the knots and then the reds so of this, this current decade. And if you were to take away 2017, BC would be really quiet, okay? And when we add 2018, it's gonna be quite a, another change. But once again, I, I think you can see for a large part that, you know, this isn't, fire isn't an Alberta problem or a BC problem or Ontario problem or Quebec problem. Fire is from sea to sea to sea. And there's breaks in there because some places have no fuel like between Yukon and Northwest Territories and Eastern Ontario has less fire than, than other areas of the boreal, um, maybe due to climate, um, maybe other things are driving that. So 
this is my philosophy. Uh, and, you know, if one wanted to draw a tri triangle, fire people love triangles, you could do one for this one. Um, you need three ingredients. Fuel. Um, how much, what type, how dry, how, how it's structured. All, all these aspects are important. Ignition, human, and lightning. And the third, weather, hot, dry, windy. Extreme weather, like we were talking about earlier. So you need all three, but I would argue that weather's the most important. Now, I may be uh, unabashedly biased, but weather also influences two of the other factors or ingredients. Lightning is a function of the weather, and also fuel moisture is a function of the weather. And fuel moisture really determines if a fire will start, if it will spread, and how intense that fire will be. So fire issues. We spend an average of $800 million on direct fire management expenditures, and this has been increasing. Um, of course, health and safety of Canadians, evacuations and smoke, property timber losses, uh, watersheds, uh, water quantity, quality, uh, work done by all the CILINs here at the University of Alberta has shown that the impacts of fire on water and watersheds can last decades. And it's not just a, a ephemeral one, one shot thing, it, there's consequences. And of course, after the fire, when you get rain, landslides can be deadly. Um, traditional approaches to fire suppression, fire management may be reaching their limit in terms of economic and physical abilities. So the top slide there is one that I took um, in August. And you know, our summers are short enough in Edmonton and it's really, um, Unfortunate that we had so much smoke that was uh, affecting our, our summer. And this is a picture looking on the south side of the North Saskatchewan River, looking towards downtown. And if there wasn't smoke, you'd see the legislature, lots of tall office buildings, and it's only a kilometer away. And up at all you see, you know, between those two apartment buildings and that spruce tree is smoke and more smoke and more smoke. So fire impacts. Location, location, location. It's just like real estate. If the Slave Lake fire had started 100 kilometers east, we wouldn't be talking about it because it'd be just burning uh, the boreal forests of northern Saskatchewan. And maybe the Star Phoenix and Saskatoon paper would say, uh, you know, bad air quality from smoke from northern Saskatchewan fires. But that'd be about the size of it. So there's been lots of fire globally. 2017 was a very uh, devastating year. Places like Chile, Portugal, Spain, South Africa, Ireland, Green, Greenland, yes, Greenland. Greenland had fires before, but they had quite an active fire season last year. California, of course, with uh, you know Northern California and Southern California. And of course, last year, there was significant fire in BC, Alberta, and the Northwest Territory, Saskatchewan, Manitoba. This year, deadly fires in Greece and California, significant fires in England and Sweden, British Columbia, Ontario, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, globally, smoke-related fatalities, mort mortalities estimate 330,000 plus per year, mostly in Southeast Asia, and um, mostly due to a lot of the peak fires going on there. Now, the bottom is a tweet from August 18th, and Edmonton had the distinction of having the worst air quality for any city that they collect data for, and that's city sizes of 250,000 or more. And uh, there was that one particular day that, on the last slide, I showed you the picture of the smoke. It was a really bad day in that week. When I got up, you know, the sun was starting to get up, it was starting to get bright, and then it got darker and darker and darker because of all the smoke rolling in. And there are serious consequences to that amount of smoke, especially at the 2 p.m. 2.5. So we're going to switch gears. And now we're going to talk about climate change for a while. Um, this is data from the Mauna Loa Observatory on the big island of Hawaii. And it was the first monitoring station that I'm aware of. It started in the late 50s. And uh, 
on the y-axis, it's parts per million, and on the x-axis is year. And you can see we're going up and up and up, and we're over 400 parts per million now. Uh, Pre-industrial, 270, 280 parts per million. And one can look back in time uh, using ice cores, and how these are used is um, they take cores from places like the Antarctic, and that's where the longest record comes from, Vostok, um, that go back 400,000 years, and there's little air bubbles trapped in these cores, and they can measure the concentration. And so that pre-industrial, that blue line there, is just under 280 parts per million. And then in the 1800s, with the Industrial Revolution and burning of fossil fuels, we can see we're on an upward trajectory and it's just gonna continue unless we do something. So simply, okay, the greenhouse effect. And what's going on is the sun is about 6,000 degrees and it's sending most of its energy in shorter wavelengths. There's closer to about 300 degrees Kelvin and it is sending most of its energy as long waves. And so we have a number of constituents of our atmosphere, water vapor, carbon dioxide, et cetera, that are more or less transparent to the shorter wavelengths coming from the sun. And that's, you know, the solar energy drives our climate system, but more opaque to the longer wavelengths. So when the energy tries to escape, it gets bounced back to the earth and you know for example if on a cold winter's night if it's a clear sky it's quite cold but if there's clouds around it's not generally as cold because that those that cloud layer is trapping the heat in it's like acting like a blanket and that's essentially what's going on now what a lot of people don't understand is that there's a natural greenhouse effect even if there was no people on this planet because there's always carbon dioxide and water vapor, and so it's keeping us warmer than we otherwise would be. It's about 30 degrees is the natural warming effect. So, you know, on a Celsius scale, we're about plus 15 for global temperature. Without this effect, we'd be minus 15, and we'd be a much different planet. So global temperatures, and, you know, we're going, it was up and down from, you know, 1880, how, you know, 30s were warmer into the 40s, then kind of leveled off in 50s and 60s. And then since about the late 70s, we've been going up and up and more recently, quite dramatically up and up. So here is an animation and hopefully uh, everyone can see this. And there is a, a scale for the temperature on the left-hand side. The blues, and this is typical for, for most weather animations, blues are the colders and the reds and oranges are warmer. And you can see the years, hopefully you can see this, you can see the five-year periods running from 1880s uh, to present day. And the blues, you know, there's regional and temporal variations, but as you get to about the late 70s, you start to see the oranges and yellows much more dominant. And this is using a 1951 to 1980 baseline. And these are the anomalies in degrees F. This is an American animation, thus degrees Fahrenheit. So you can see that these are observations that we are much, we're warmer than we were. We've been warming. So 2016 was the warmest year on record. And, uh, and this map shows areas where it was warmer than average, near average or below average. And there were some areas in the oceans and North Atlantic and the, uh, off Antarctica and even parts of the Pacific that were normal or even below normal. But you can see a lot of areas that were warm or even record warmest. Um, so um, it's a much warmer world. And you know, in 2017 winter and 2018 winter, we saw episodes where very warm, anonymously warm air made it into the Arctic. And this graph is from February 2018, or this map, and it shows temperatures as much as 40 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than average. And um, there's been a number of these episodes, 
and that have no uh, modern historical analog and breaking records. Temperatures near zero Celsius at the North Pole during the winter, just never observed before. So uh, here's 2017, which wasn't quite as warm as 2016, but it was the warmest year that didn't have a El Nino. El Nino does affect our global climate and makes us warmer. Now the Paris Agreement talks about keeping temperatures below two degrees Celsius. But you'll see even in the year 2017, there was chunks of the planet, you know, the latitudes on the x-axis that are 60 to 80, 90 degrees, there are areas there that are already two degrees or more above baseline. So some parts of the planet have already exceeded this two degree threshold. I had this graph fairly recently. Um, we're over 400 months globally where the temperature anomaly has been above normal. And you can see it's becoming larger and larger. Once again, this is uh, from a NOAA, which is an American organization, so it's in degrees Fahrenheit. December 1984, which I actually do remember um, being cold um, where I was, was the last month that globally we were below normal. Um, that's a long period, and this is not by chance, by any means. We are warming. So climate change projections. There's GCMs. When I started working in this business, they were general circulation models. Now a lot of people call them global climate models. Call them what you want. Uh, they suggest warming up to six degrees by the end of the century, uh, which is very significant. Greatest increases, high latitudes over land in winter and spring, except when the Arctic Ocean is free, and people argue about when that will occur. Some people say as early as the 2030s, some say 2050s, but it's, it's on course to happen sometime this century. That will change things dramatically. And the reason for this is something called albedo, which is the reflectivity. So the solar radiation comes in and snow is, has a high albedo, so it reflects all the energy back to space. Water has a low albedo and absorbs a lot of solar radiation. So of note for fire is the projected increases in extreme weather. And once again, so heat waves, droughts, floods, wind storms, ice storms, um, but once again, not every year is going to be a bad fire year or a bad year for droughts. Uh, so there's a lot of spatial and temporal variability. So here's another animation, and this is of what the future may look like. And top center, you can see the year passing, we're just past the, in the 2020s. And once again, the reds and oranges are uh, above normal, and the blues, greens and blues are below normal. And you see that, you know, not everywhere is warming. There are parts of the ocean, southern oceans and the North Atlantic that show no change or even cooling. And that's because the oceans do play a major role in our climate system. And some of the ocean circulation um, has, has lag periods of up to, for deep ocean waters, up to a thousand years. But the take home message here is that it's a much warmer world if these models are anywhere close to reality. So work done what, 13 years ago uh, by myself and colleagues suggested that by the end of this century, which is what equivalent three times CO2 is, that we were looking for about a doubling of area burned across Canada. Other uh, more slightly more recent work by Mike Walshie and others for Alaska and Western Canada suggested increases from 2.5 to 5.5 times current levels. So very significant increases in fire activity. So in the work that Balshi did, that I showed you in the slide from two, two slides ago that I did on area burned and fire for studies in Canada, United States, and Russia, we find that temperature is a key component to fire activity. That is, the warmer it gets, the more fire we see. And what I'm talking about here is not an individual fire where things like wind becomes 
really critical. But what I'm talking about is a larger area for a longer period of time. For example, like the province of British Columbia for a fire season or a month. Um, and I get asked all the time, why is temperature so important? Well, three reasons, and I'll do it probably in reverse order here. Uh, longer fire seasons, and we're seeing that. In Alberta, officially our fire season used to start at the beginning of April, April 1st. Now it's March 1st. And in 2016 and 2017, we had fires in February. Not in 2018, we had a cold spring. Second, lightning. Uh, work done by researchers in the States, ROMPS, uh, and others found that as we warm, we get more lightning. There they found for every degree of warming about 12% increase in lightning activity. Now, uh, in Canada, I would expect something similar, perhaps even more a larger increase because uh, we have a short lightning season and with climate change, our lightning season is getting longer. But probably the most important reason is drier fuels, okay? So what's going on here? As the atmosphere warms, its ability to hold moisture increases almost exponentially. This means that the vapor pressure difference as a result of this is much larger so that the atmosphere gets a bit more effective at drying the fuels unless there's an increase in precipitation. And most of the models don't, models of future climate don't suggest this type of increase in precipitation where we found for finer fuels that for every degree of warming, you need about 15% increase in precipitation to compensate for this drying effect from the warming. And almost none of the models in any region have, or any scenario, have that kind of increase in precipitation. For many parts of Canada, we're looking at three degrees Celsius warming, which would mean you need a 45% increase in precipitation. And that's just doesn't seem to be coming out in models. Bottom line, drier fuels. Drier fuels means it's easier for fires to start and spread. And in fact, drier fuels means there's more fuel available for consumption, which can lead to higher intensity fires. Higher intensity fires are more challenging or impossible to put up. So I'm gonna talk about some work that Mike Watton, Jenny Marshall and I um, did last year, yes. So the, the work on the fuel drying by temperature was work published by myself and others uh, in 2016, if you're interested in looking that up. So this work done by Watton et al. last year looked at three GCMs, uh, the K and the Hadley and the CSIRO, so CSIRO, which is an Australian model, three RCPs, kind of the standard uh, set, 2.6, 4.5, and 8.5. We calculated the Canadian Fire Weather Index system for a baseline um, and then compared it to what the future was. And FWI system, for those who may not know, it's a weather-based system based on temperature, relative humidity, wind speed, and precipitation. So from the Canadian Forest Fire Danger Rating System, we use the FBP system as well to calculate fire intensity, rate of spread, depth of burn, fuel consumption, crown fraction, and we looked specifically at days above key, what we consider to be key thresholds. And they are 2,000 kilowatts per meter. We call these head fire intensity and 10,000. And these are key in that above 2,000, it becomes dangerous for people to work that fire. Some people use 4,000. We feel 2,000 is the more legit, legitimate number. The reason for 10,000 once a fire exceeds that, we're generally talking about a crown fire, which means it's difficult to impossible to put out and where aerial attack using water retardant becomes ineffective or less effective. We use a national fuel that database at 250 meters, but we aggregated it to 40 cells by 40 cells to make this kind of doable in a reasonable amount of time. Um, and you can see the top panel is the 250 meter resolution and the bottom panel is our 40 kilometer aggregate. And you can see it's, it's, it seems to do fairly well. 
So these are animations once again, and you'll see the RCP in the top left-hand corner and time period. And this is the number of days changed in the future with each scenario above 2,000. And you can see some parts of the central boreal are now you know, 60 days more than what it was uh, or what it is today. So significant increases in the number of days above 2,000. Now here's 10,000, and you can see once again, runs through the RCP, the more moderate 4.5, and then the more severe 8.5 for kind of early century and late century. Of course, the biggest increases are with the 8.5 end of century, where we're seeing increases of 40 days to 60 days kind of thing, uh, which is really significant because if there's an ignition, and the fire is running, uh, it's basically, you can't stop it. So here is surface and, and crown fuel consumption from this work and for uh, different time periods. And you can see that there are you know, differences, and, but there's a lot of increase in fuel consumption in places three, four times more. Now this is interesting in that previous work done by Amiro et al, uh, 2009, if memory serves, that most of the increases in emissions from forest fires were due to, for future climate scenarios, were due to increased area burn and not due to increased consumption. This now suggests with this model that a lot of the increase in emissions will be coming from increased fuel consumption, which was not what we found in 2009. So, of course, if you have higher intensity fires, then they're more likely to escape. And work done by Porter and Watton suggested that, you know, the area burn will increase significantly if there's more escape fires, up to a factor of eight, if I remember. And so in this slide is a picture from this summer and you can see all the smoke from all the fires. That's the BC Washington border, and there's the Alberta border. The smoke's pouring up across the Rockies into Alberta and beyond. Smoke from these fires uh, went to Eastern North America, then to Europe, and can encircle the globe. So the impacts from fires just not, does not affect the local area, but can be a global impact. So uh, I want to talk about the jet stream. And we've been hearing about the jet stream a fair bit recently in the news. Um, that's changing. And the, the reason it's changing is due to climate change. And you go, whoa, 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 what's going on here? So the jet stream first is that band of fast moving air. If you're on a plane, if you're riding the jet stream going in the same direction, you get to your destination faster. If you're flying against it, you're delayed. And it really dictates where the high pressures will go, where the low pressures will go, how fast they move, how intense they are. So, so it really governs our day-to-day -day weather at the surface. Now, the jet stream gets its energy from the temperature difference between equatorial areas and polar areas. So in the Northern Hemisphere, our Arctic regions are warming up much more rapidly than the equatorial areas, so that temperature difference is smaller. So that means there's less energy. It's like a fast flowing river versus a slow flowing river where you get eddies and stagnation. And so where this stagnation happens, it can be really bad news on both sides. So there's what we call ridges and highs and lows and troughs. And where the ridges and highs are, this is a region of air that is sinking, warming and drying. And if it stays there for seven or 10 days or longer, we can call it a blocking ridge. Omega block sometimes in the bomb figure, you can see a 500 millibar map, you can see the shape of the Greek letter omega, okay? Now fire people have known for 50, 60 years about blocking ridges being really important for fire. So this is nothing new, but what we're finding with a stagnant jet stream is that these blocks are more intense and staying even longer. So those regions, you get drought and fire. Conversely, 
where the lows and troughs are, this is just like your grade three water cycle, air rises, cools, condenses, forms clouds and rains. But the pattern is stagnant, it continues to rain and rain and rain and get flooding. So it's very uh, conducive to extreme weather. And work published by Michael Mann last year said exactly that. Our jet stream is weakening and we're seeing more extreme weather. And once again, more extreme weather means more fire in most situations because there'll be more extreme drought, more extreme wind, et cetera, et cetera. So I've been talking about weather and climate. And, but there's another side of this coin in terms of fire impacts, and that's development. So now more than ever, Canadians live and work in the forest. Development's increasing in parts of the country. Uh, more people generally means more fire, more exposure to the consequences of fire. Um, so this just shows development in Alberta, and you can see it around the Fort McMurray area, around the cities and around Grand Prairie, there's lots of development. And there is a, a quote from an op-ed, and this is from 2016. So this was a year before the devastating 2017 fires. Why do we keep putting people in the way of wildfire? In the last 10 years, 60% of new homes in the U.S. have been built on lands adjacent to fire-prone public lands. I have seen some recent studies from Montana that suggest that this is about right. I've not seen any studies for Canada to know if this is even in the same ballpark. I'm guessing it might be, okay? But the, what I'm saying here is as there's more people and activities in the forest, the impacts are going to increase. So what can we do, all right? So if we go back, you know, to the three ingredients, you know, what can we do? So hot, dry, windy weather, the day-to-day -day weather, we can't do much about that. Um, Globally, if we get our act together and reduce greenhouse gas emissions, yes, maybe we can reduce the amount of extreme fire weather occurrences. But even if we stop producing greenhouse gases today, we are gonna to continue to warm for the next 50 to 100 years because of the lags in our climate system. We can't do anything about lightning, okay? We can and we do things about human-caused fires but I would argue that every human caused fire is preventable. So there's more that we can do. Uh, we use fire bans, uh, forest closures. We probably don't use those often enough because they're very effective. And then the last thing is fuel, okay? And that's where a lot of energy has been spent on fuel management, and especially around areas of uh, societal value, like communities. Um, and we cannot make our communities fire proof we can try and make them more fire resistant. So, but the bottom line is we have to learn to live with fire, okay? And that's why you know, using modified response or appropriate response is useful to get us there. You know, we have to learn to work with mother nature and not fight her, okay? Because when we, you know, we've had this war on fire, we've tried to stop fire for decades and it's just, sorry, it's not working, okay? In fact, in some places we're getting our butts kicked. Um, so, but if we can learn to live with fire and allow fire when and where possible on the landscape, it can create a patchwork mosaic. And a recently burned area, at least for the forest, is unlikely to reburn for 15 to 20 years. And in fact, if it's a wetland, it may be 50 or 60 years before it's ready to reburn. So it creates a patchwork on the landscape where if you do get a high intensity fire, it's not long before it burns into one of these more recently burned patches where it either can go out or will burn at much lower intensity and fire management can put it out if it's deemed an uh, unwanted fire. So the climate is changing. We're going to see more extreme weather, more extreme fire weather, and we're going to see more fire on the landscape. And once again, it's not every year is going to be a bad year and it's going to we'll have regional variability but in general, expect more fire. And you know, people say, well, if you get more and more fire, soon the forest will disappear, or at some point the forest will disappear. And then people argue about, will it be the conifers will be the last to go, or be uh, aspen will be the last to go. And it's really about arguing, you know, with you know, rearranging deck chairs in the Titanic. It doesn't really matter if there's too much fire, they'll all go. But what replaces it? Well, grass and shrubs. 
and they can burn even more frequently than, than four. So as long as you've got fuel, ignitions, and weather, away we go. I would like to bring to your attention Fire Smart Canada. Uh, there's seven principles. Fuel management is just one of those. Planning, education, cooperation, training, and development. And they have a great website, and we encourage you to look at it when you have a chance. Um, the slide on the right is May 15th. 2011, and fire people will know that this is the day that the fire entered into Slate Lake and burned us there the town. Now, it's maybe hard to see if you can see my cursor, that's Slate Lake, and it's just a little red dot the fire that entered into uh, Slate Lake. So, once again, location, 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 that fire was really close to town. This is the Uticama fire, which is a quite a large fire, and over on the right hand side is the Richardson fire, which ended up burning about 600,000 hectares, more than the Fort Mac fire by a little bit. And there is Lake Athabasca off to the top right and still covered with ice. So part two, how managing wildfires in the future. We need to update our Canadian forest fire danger rating system. It's a great system. Parts of it are 40 to 50 years old and need updating. Um, we need an enhanced early warning system uh, machine learning possibly could uh, help, especially with severe fire weather episodes, using self-organized maps. That's work we published last year. Uh, possibly using machine learning and building fire occurrence prediction systems. And they're not here to replace the existing system, but rather to enhance existing fire decision support systems. Uh, more remote sensing. Um, remote sensing is being used more and more but many people aren't trained in it and uh, the Canadian Partnership is going to be offering courses in uh, the use of remote sensing for fire management. Um, so a very practical hands-on short course. Focus on community zones, sprinklers, an initial attack, uh, so we put out those unwanted fires. A fire that starts two kilometers from Kamloops is unwanted fire. It takes half a second, you hit hard, you hit fast. Um, emergency management phases, prevention, mitigation, preparedness, response, recovery, and some people say review as well. And some people combine prevention and mitigation. In the fire world, we probably put a lot effort in response. Uh, we do a fair bit of preparation, but I think we can improve on prevention. We do some, but I think we can be better. Mitigation, and we, we don't do much in terms of recovery and review. Um, fuel management should be looked at in concert with harvesting, grazing, and carbon management. Um, I was just doing an interview this morning about the use of goats for uh, managing fuels around communities, and I think that's a... a one more tool for the toolbox. So this is an op-ed uh, from a friend and a colleague, Ed Struzik, and this was in the Los Angeles Times, if I remember, yeah, Los Angeles Times. And you know, with the Arctic, the way the Arctic ice is melting, that's acting as an anchor point for some of these blocking ridges and getting ridges along the west coast. Uh, of North America, where they almost become semi-permanent. And we saw this 2017, and once again, we saw it in 2018 with all the fires, California, Oregon, Washington, and BC. So, and where the, where the ridges are, more drought, more fire. So here's a graph of British Columbia area burned. Um, and Last year, 2017, was head and shoulders above the previous uh, record, which was 1958, which was head and shoulders above the previous record of 1961. Now, there may be more fire before 1950, um, but for this period, 2017 and now 2018 stick out like sore thumbs. And indeed, if you add the area burn in the last two years, that's more than the previous 27 years. Um, Wow, um, yeah, I did not expect this. So I'm going to be wrapping up soon. Fire and weather are strongly linked. Um, picture on the right hand side is from Fort McMurray above waterways. It's a few weeks after the fire went through the community. And you still see some hot, hot spots smoldering in the background there. 
but in the foreground, maybe hard to see, there's little aspens popping up. And then later that fall in 2016, uh, one of my graduate students at the time, Sin Lee Kai, took a picture and aspens coming back, like hair on a dog's back. Now it didn't come back like that everywhere, but that's, our forests are fairly resilient, unless they get a double whammy, um, where you get two disturbances in a row, uh, fire and fire, or in, insects, pests and fire, disease and fire, etc. Changes in forest fires may be the greatest early impact of climate change on forests. People could argue for things like well, pine beetle as well, and that would be a fair argument. Fire activity will increase, but will be variable in time and space. Longer fire seasons, this can be a problem for fire management because we can see high intensity fires occurring outside their normal period. So, and I would argue that 2017 BC fires starting on July 7th is an example of that. And possibly the Fort McMurray fire, May 1st. Uh, fire is not uncommon in, in Alberta in May, but in that part of Alberta, it's more of a traditional boreal season, kind of a summer season, the early May season. And it leads to challenges. Um, more fire occurrence, more crown fires, higher intensity, more difficult to put out, uh, increased fuel consumption, more area burn. And, you know, fire management is very adaptive, but it's good, you know, it's a challenging profession, and it's only going to be more challenging. We may be entering territory with no historical analogs, uh, the unknown unknowns, uh, we can guess as to the known unknowns, but the unknown unknowns, we don't have a clue. So when we talk about no, new normal, uh, you know, I prefer to avoid that term because it sounds like it's a plateau. It's really a trajectory that's getting worse and worse and worse unless we do something about it. And there could be surprises that will catch us off guard. Um, who would have thought? you know, the 2.5 million hectares would burn in BC in the last two seasons, if you were talking to people in 2016. Um, fire and society interact, and these interactions will increase in the future. So lastly, we need significant investment in fire, fire research and development. Um, some of the provinces have stepped up, and that's great, okay? Uh, but the federal government in particular, and you know, I won't pull punches, I think NSERF has dropped the ball. They don't give fire research the respect it deserves. And we need to support the fire research community and to get new people, young people doing fire research. So I'd like to thank you for your attention, um, hopefully. And just draw attention to, we have a Twitter account, uh, Canada Wildfire, Instagram account, a website that's shown there. Um, some of the sponsors of the fire research that I presented, Global Water Futures, Boreal Water Futures, uh, Government of Alberta, Alberta Agriculture and Forestry, University of Alberta, NSERP, uh, Intact has given us money to look at artificial intelligence and wildfire. So just leave it at that and that's a beautiful picture of a pyrocumulonimbus from northwest territories taken by dennis quintilio you can see the gray fire smoke and then the billowy cotton ball cauliflower pyrocumulonimbus in july 14th of 2014. thank you thank you very much mike uh, this was a great presentation uh, I'll just like to remind everyone, if you have any questions for our speaker, please uh, feel free to ask them in the, in the question box. So I'm going to start with a question from Paul Kovacs, who would first like to thank you for your outstanding presentation. Uh, he's wondering if you could please share your views about the state of fire research. Uh, more specifically, what are some of the major unknowns where further research is needed, and what do we need to learn to better promote resilience in the uh, wildland urban interface? Thanks, Paul. That's, I think there's about three questions there. Um, yes. <laughs> there are good questions. Um, so, you know, in terms of priorities, uh, this is, I'll start with a known unknown. <laughs> well, I'll start with a known, okay? Our Canadian Forest Fire Danger Rating System is great, but 
it was built in a different era with when we had different data and different needs from the broader community. So, for example, you know, weather data. Uh, we have satellites now, we have radar now, we can use solar. There are so many more things that we can do. And originally it was built as a daily system. The demand now is really for hourly or sub-hourly systems in some situa situations. So this is one area that needs to be addressed. And you know, people have been working on it, but it needs significant investment. The other areas I would suggest is, you know, well, I'll give you a fire occurrence prediction. Um, we have models for lightning and human caused fire occurrence. The lightning ones uses it observed lightning and then fuel moisture. And then what's the fuel moisture going to be today and tomorrow? Something called holdover fires that are smoldering and waiting for the proper conditions. But we don't have a fire occurrence prediction model that uses predicted lightning activity. And there are models out there that predict where and when we expect lightning. How good they are, that's a fair question, but we need to do more work. Things like machine learning, um, they show some promise. And the reason they show promise for severe fire weather, as opposed to the current system, is that the current system relies heavily on precipitation, part of our FWI system where they just use the forecasted weather. Numerical weather prediction isn't great at summertime convective precipitation. It's just not, okay? Whereas the artificial intelligence, machine learning is using pressure fields, upper air, like where we're talking about block, blocking ridges, and the surface where the highs and lows are. Numerical weather prediction does a much better job at predicting pressure fields. So I, I think that's another area of improvement. So we do have kind of an early warning system, but I think that can be enhanced to, so because the reason I, early warning systems are so important is if there was a fire today in Timmins and there's not enough resources, they call SIFSI, which is in Winnipeg, and they say, we need helicopters, we need a fire crew or a three. The time you place that call till the time that the people, the firefighters, he or she are on that fire line or the helicopters there is often three days, okay? If you want resources from the United States or Mexico or New Zealand, you, you need more strategic, longer term planning. And so these are areas we need to work on. In terms of our two or three of these, governments that are leading the way in terms of best practices. So, you know, uh, a lot of work is being done, money is being spent. Most of the effort's been spent on treating fuels around communities. And I think we need a, a more broader holistic approach as suggested through Fire Smart Canada where it's not just fuel management. Fuel management is one tool in the toolbox, but we have to look at a whole bunch of other things as well. And I think I'll stop there so that other people can have a shot. Thank you, Mike. Um, another question we have, uh, you mentioned that the Canadian Forest uh, Fire Danger Rating System needs to be updated. Are you aware if there are discussions to uh, do that at the moment and what type of work would be needed to, to get there? Sure. Yes, well, there's been um, a group led by Mike Watton. Uh, he's a senior scientist, research scientist with the Kane Forest Service, stationed at the University of Toronto. He's also an adjunct at the University of Toronto, teaches some fire courses. And he has been spearheading, you know, the enhancement or the updating of our current system. Um, and I'll, I'll be direct, the funding has been recently non-existent, okay, or you know, not significant in any way, shape, or means. So it's hard to do development when you have no money, okay? And what we're looking at is updating that WI system and the FBP system in particular. Uh, the FWI system probably just needs some minor tweaking to take into account solar radiation where possible, 
uh, you know, adjusting for, you know, we use kind of a standard diurnal curve that's not, you know, that's normalized and some days don't fit that in Alberta. We get in the spring, we can get dry, windy conditions with a southeast wind for days and days and days where overnight recovery just does not happen. In terms of FDP, the idea is to make it backward compatible. So those people that are used to the fuel types will continue to use them, but where you have more detailed information, there'll be a characterization of the fuel at the ground, in the shrub, and then story layer in the canopy. These are types of things that are being discussed or have been discussed, but it's really in a holding pattern because of lack of funding. Um, but, you know, there's lots of people interested. Many of the fire management agencies they say, hey, if you're updating the system, you know, yeah, we're, you know, tell us about it. How, how can we help? All right. And that's great. But at this point, we're in this holding pattern until there's significant funding. And, you know, some of the funding's coming from places like provinces, like Alberta's been stepping up to the plate and helping us build that next generation or updating our current system. That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, another question coming for you. Uh, what are your thoughts regarding the percentage of provincial funding spent in response versus prevention and mitigation? Is there data available on the value of dollars spent on prevention and mitigation? Now, that's a good question. And I think you know how I feel that, you know, I think we should, could be doing more on prevention and mitigation. And, you know, there are, um, there are papers out there. This is starting to stray into a field where it's not my core subject area. But I, and I don't know of any work being done in Canada, but I thought there was some work done in the States where, you know, you know, it's like a four or 10, people say four to one, 10 to one, for every dollar spent, you get, you save 10 bucks. If you spend a dollar in prevention, you know, it saves you 10 bucks on response. Uh, you know, ounce of prevention worth a pound of cure. Now, other people argue that, you know, fires are gonna happen regardless, okay? And, you know, in terms of lightning, for sure. For people cause, I, I tend to think that we can do a better job. Um, and, you know, the California fires, Northern California fires last year, um, a lot of them were caused by power lines. And, you know, I said, well, you can bury power lines. And, this, and I was told it's expensive. Yes, but, you know, the insurable losses and, and the non-insurable losses for the Northern California fires alone is above $10 billion, okay? So it's worth it, okay? Or if you are going to have power lines above ground, spend the money to design that they can withstand the strong Diablo winds, and make sure that there's no trees close by that could fall on those power lines and start a fire. So we can do more. And I mentioned forest closures as well. I think forest closures, if enforced, are very effective. In some jurisdictions, there's reluctance to do that because, you know, industry doesn't want to shut down for the day. All right. And I get that. But it's a relatively small number of days where it's the, this extreme fire weather where we need to keep people out of the forest. If you keep the people out, the human caused fires go away. I hope that partially answered your question. Yeah. Um, following up on that question, uh, you mentioned that lead responsibility for fire management in Canada is with provincial and territorial governments and some federal government agencies like uh, Parks Canada, for example. In your opinion, are there two or three of these governments that are uh, leading the way in terms of best practices uh, and uh, committing to action uh, regarding uh, wildfire uh, mitigation and prevention? So that's an interesting question. Um, so yes, fire management is a responsibility of landowners. And, you know, I can't, I don't know all of them intimately, so it's really difficult to compare. I will say that, you know, I've worked with Alberta, British Columbia, and Ontario, and these are uh, modern professional organizations doing their best, and 
they do a really great job. And, you know, um, and some of it's dependent on funding. Uh, so if you want to have a, a plan to make communities more fire resistant, it's going to cost money. Significant investment. And some provinces have put millions of dollars. I know Alberta has. I think I read recently BC has now devoted significant millions of dollars to help make communities more fire resistant. Uh, what's going on in every other jurisdiction, it's hard for me to say. Um, you know, there's continuing education programs. Uh, there's avenues through CIFC that can help sharing what best practices. So, you know, these are organizations that want to do the best job possible, and they're all moving in that, in that direction, some at different speeds. And for different reasons, too, because the fire situation and challenges in BC may be quite different than those in New Brunswick. So different solutions in different locations. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, I have a question that, um, <clears throat> sorry, is specific to an earlier portion of your presentation. So mm -hmm. uh, the person is asking, isn't an annual area burned of 2.5 to 3 million hectares roughly equivalent to a fire cycle of 75 years, which would in turn be considered a natural fire cycle based on various fire history studies uh, that have been done across Canada? On average, yeah, I'd say that's pretty close. Uh, so, but there's a, a regional variation in that, okay? And, you know, some areas in Labrador may have fire cycle, if we're gonna use that term of 500 years, okay? Other places in northern Saskatchewan or northwestern Ontario, maybe closer to 40 years or 50 years. So but it's the trend that's, go, that's really important. Um, and we're seeing more and more fire. And if the models of the future are anywhere close to reality, we expect a lot more fire in the future. And you know, with this recent work with Mike Watton, more increases in fire intensity and that's the real concern that may lead to a, a, a big increase in area burned um, because as fires become more intense, they become difficult to impossible to put out. Okay, thank you. Uh, we also have another question. Uh, could you please provide more information about the courses to be offered about using remote sensing for fire management? Sure. Um, there's a website, uh, I think the slides are still visible, uh, www.canadawildfire.org. If you go there, we will be posting shortly uh, outline and details for registration. The current plan is that uh, we'll be offering it in Alberta early in 2018 and in March, probably in Thunder Bay, uh, Ontario uh, will offer the course for those people in Ontario and out east. Um, everyone's welcome. It's kind of, you know, the appropriate use of remote sensing for fire management, all the caveats, avoid misapplication, basic concepts. It's really kind of, you know, hands on for operational fire people, F bands, duty officers, GIS people, rangers, even anyone who's interested. I gave a fire weather course uh, January of this year, and there was about 20 people. And during the fire weather course, I used things like satellites. And I asked the class, how many people use satellite data? And all the hands went up. I said, oh, that's great. How many of you had a course on remote sensing? Not one hand went up. And I said, well, this is an obvious need. So, and feel free to contact me directly with respect to, you know, short courses, and particularly the remote sensing course. Um, my email is mike.flanagan at ualberta.ca, or just Google Mike Flanagan and you should be able to find me. Um, and we're interested in hosting the fire weather course again. So if you're interested in that, uh, we'll try and get something set up. Or if there's other areas where we, you feel you need continuing education in a broader fire environment, other than fire behavior, the Hinton, Training Center, the Hinton Training Center has the specialist course and the advanced course. 
and run through CFC. And that's, so we're not touching fire behavior at all, but any other fire aspect, yes, do contact us. Okay, Thanks. thank Bye. you. Thank you, Mike. Um, <clears throat> so you mentioned that Canadians need to learn to uh, live with fire and the risk of fire, and that the public should not expect that all fires will be put out immediately. Uh, yes. In your opinion, how can we best communicate the objective to fire ma uh, of fire management so the public understand that there will be some fire risk? Well, it's through things like this, public consultation, newspapers, websites. Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, Ontario, I think, is doing a really good job. Uh, you know, they've adopted this appropriate response and have documents on their website and do their best to explain to people what appropriate response is. And really it's allowing fire when and where possible to play a more natural role in the landscape. So it means at times there might be smoke, okay? But a little smoke now versus a lot of smoke later and you know, smoke from a distance as opposed to smoke at your doorstep. You know, th these are kind of things we have to learn to live with. It's, it's not gonna go away. Um, and you know, if half of what I've said is true today, we're gonna to see more fire and more smoke. Um, it's just part of the, the new reality. Great, thank you. Uh, staying on the topic, you mentioned that Fire Smart was a key program in helping uh, reduce risk for homeowners. Uh, in your opinion, are there key actions or key, uh, you mentioned there's seven areas of Fire Smart, key things that should be prioritized by homeowners? Among in this program? So FireSmart is for homeowners and communities, okay? And a lot, some of it's common sense, okay? You know, don't have uh, cedar shake roofs, keep your gutters clear. Fire, most home losses are due to burning embers. So, you know, I'm sure most of the people listening in today have seen video from Fort McMurray or BC fires or California, and you see all these flames and then at times the video shows this rain of burning embers and those are the ones that are often responsible for burning homes so you get this rain of embers and it's looking for a place to start a fire so if you've got pine needles in your gutters for example oh you know away we go so it's just fire is opportunistic it's look it's looking for a path to to spread and any opportunity it has don't stack firewood against your house. Certain types of shrubbery are very flammable, so don't have those close to your house. Reducing the amount of flammable fuels near your house, green grass. But, you know, it really is about community action, you know, and I liken it to immunization. If you don't get enough people immunized, then measles or whatever can spread through the community. If enough people don't do the fire smarting, I mean, you can do everything right. And the neighbors on either side of you don't do anything, if their house is burned, then your house may burn just from house to house burning. So it really needs to be a community action. And I do encourage people to go to the Fire Smart website and feel free to contact people at Fire Smart. They're knowledgeable and helpful. And uh, so it, there are things you can do as a homeowner, property owner, but also it's really important to get involved at the community level. And there are seven principles. Fuel management is just one of them, education, cooperation. Uh, I had some of the others on the slide. The website will do a much better job than I explaining those. Thank you very much. Uh, we have one more question on the line. Uh, if anyone has any other questions they'd like to ask, now would be a great time to uh, write them into the question box. Uh, so the question we have, uh, so you and others have published research on the likelihood of increased area burn. In particular, you have explained why there will be a growing risk of fires growing out of control. Is there research assessing the area burnt with the risk of damage to structures? Uh, great question. No, not to my knowledge. Um, you know, there are, there are people looking at the wildland urban interface and structure losses. There's been some work in uh, Australia uh, looking at loss, um, but not in Canada, to my knowledge. People like Al Westhaver may know if I'm wrong on that, and I maybe have been wrong many times before. So, Al, if you're here, 
do do feel to add to the chat and correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm not. There are studies that looked at case studies like Fort McMurray that looked at that, but no. Um, but what I think is the first step is to look at how the wildland urban interface, that, that zone where fire and society interact, how it's going to change in the future. And I'm hoping people like Lynn Johnston, if you're on the line, um, will run with that, okay? So that will be kind of the first step to get to, to answer your question. That's great, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for an outstanding webinar today, uh, not only from me, but we got a lot of comments from people on the line who are very appreciative of your presentation, so thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone, or to let everyone know that uh, the recording from today will be available uh, next week on our YouTube channel, and the slides will be made available as well. So uh, Mike, thank you very much. Uh, do you have any last thoughts that you'd like to share with the audience? Um, no, it's, this has been fun. Thanks. Um, hope you have a, a, a great fall. No, it's not right. fall yet, but anyway, it feels like <laughs> there's snow on the ground. So, thank you. That's great. Perfect. Thank you very much, and thank everyone. Thanks. Thank you everyone for uh, coming today to this webinar, and uh, we'll see you soon for our next Friday forum. Thank you.